Donaldson, MSYP, and to briefly speak for the topic for a first debate, which is young people would be more able to make positive change to challenge negative stereotypes of young people if the voting age was lowered to 16 years of age. So, Laurie? And I want to talk shortly about how I think young people can make positive change by using the vote. First of all, we're asked to be full members of society, but we aren't allowed to vote. I feel that we are unfairly stereotyped by antisocial behaviour. And sorry guys, I'm about to Bible bash here. But uh, 1 Timothy verse 4 verse 12 says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. And personally, I'd say that we are looked down on. In schools, we must have a maximum amount of children in a shop, and often it's even low as two. Giving young people the vote would show the government believes that young people can be trusted. It says clearly that young people are smart enough to be trusted with the most important decision of the country, which is to choose the leaders of this country. That means that people would notice that actually young people are mostly intelligent and responsible individuals who do care about what happens in their country. Just wait till it goes down. Right. It also just about, it's also just about what is fair and what is right. Young people can get a job. Young people can pay taxes. But they have no control over what that money is spent on. Young people can join the army. But they have no say in what government they choose. Even though that government might send them to battle. Which is like a decision of life or death. Young people can marry and start a family. Which I would say is a pretty good, pretty big responsibility. But they aren't trusted to pick a political leader. It just doesn't make sense. Young people, in my opinion, aren't fairly represented and don't have a loud enough voice to affect what happens. If we were given the vote, we would have a chance to show that we are actually responsible as responsible as the other age groups. Parties would try harder to gain our vote so it would, you know, be better for us. We'd be asked our views on things and we would have a much louder voice in politics. It's really important because young people use so many of the services which the government provide. I mean, we can't generally drive at 16, so we have to use buses and trains. So isn't it important that we are asked our views on them, on how to make them better? And finally, young, well, second point, young people at the age of 16, they're thinking about what their job will be. They're thinking about what their next step in life is. And at the age of 18, you're probably like thinking of uni. So I think there will be a group of people who, when they get the vote, they'll take it seriously and they might even consider politics as career, which would mean that there's more likely to have younger people in this building which will represent us better. So guys, it's pretty simple. Votes at 16 would show young people could be trusted as full citizens. And if you're old enough to marry, work or join the army, you're old enough to vote. And young people really understand so many issues better than those who are older. Young people getting the vote could be the colour to add to this political spectrum. Thanks for your time. Okay, um, thank you, Laurie. Um, so let's keep those thoughts that, that Laurie's brought up in mind um, and invite Lachlan Bruce, MSYP, to briefly speak against the topic for our first debate. The age in this country that, at which you are considered to become an adult and entrusted with your full rights and responsibilities is 18 and not 16. It is the age at which you are first considered able and sensible enough to buy alcohol or cigarettes. It is the age at which you are considered able to watch any film at the cinema without any uh, censorship. It is the age at which you can first get married or join the army without parental consent first being given. It is the age at which you can change your name, apply for a passport, own land, sit on a jury, get a credit card, gamble your money and vote in elections. These are the basic things that when you get to 18 that you have to do to live. And you're not entrusted with them at 16 because you're considered not ready, not able, such. At 16 you are given some of the less important rights as a citizen, the ones that are considered less important and not as crucial to fulfil for a functioning society. Voting is the most important duty that we fulfil as citizens of a democracy. So that leaves you with a question, why would you move the voting age to 16 when at 16 you can't even be trusted to see some films at the cinema? Okay, thank you, Lachlan. Okay, so now we have, if I'd done a for and against for the argument, um, 
now it's our time um, to, to have your opinions on the matter, for or against. We can look at solutions, ideas, um, or maybe arguments to, to counter either one or the other. Um, myself and Lauren, we're going to, if you just raise your hand, we're going to pick out who'd like to say something. Um, we'll let the guys on the mic know, and if you just stand towards the microphone, you don't need to speak directly into it. You might sound a bit like Darth Vader or something, so just kind of stand back from it. Um, and if you just tell us uh, your name and what organisation you've come from today. Okay, so is there anybody who's got a, a comment on, on what was just proposed? We've just got one, uh, the, the chap in the black T-shirt. Do you want to stand up and respond to that? Yes. You did put your hands up, didn't you? <laughs> Fortune SYP. I think the, the biggest argument in my mind is you can go into the army, you can die for your country, but you can't vote on defence cuts, you can't vote on any defence policy. So the government's basically saying, oh, well, your life's good enough, but your vote's not, which I don't think makes any sense in any way you can boot it. Thank you. Ooh. Do we have any other comments coming? Yes, we've got a gentleman in the blue T-shirt here. Uh, how are you doing? I'm Jerry Brown. I'm uh, from Scottish Youth Parliament. I just wanted to say, like, I, I agree that, that people should have votes at 16, uh, but I think it's, it should be Lachlan should be commended for um, speaking up against it, because I can imagine he wouldn't get a lot of support in this kind of topic with the amount of people that are in this room that are under the age. Thanks very much. We've got one here. Yep. Do you want to... Yep. Uh, can I just sort of suggest a slight tangent, which is maybe this is more of a question about at what age should we be given what rather than should we be given the vote at 16? Because you're talking about being able to see cinemas, uh, films at 18 and do votes and whatnot, but is this not more of a wider question of when can we get what rather than should we be there for at 16? Is there a response to that? Anyone want to come forward and respond to that point? Yep, go ahead. Just in the check shirt, you want to stand up? Yep, I, I think on the, on the point of the, the age to vote, I think it's really, it's really a fundamental right of most democratic societies that you get the right to vote. And with, you know, you can pick a, if you pick a fight on too many back, on too many fronts, you know, about the age of alcohol, age of cigarettes, about uh, credit, you know, voting rights, you're not going to get anywhere. I think. The, age, the arguments in favour of the age of which you can vote at 16 are, you know, are, quite, uh, are quite strong. I think they're well made, they're, you know, they're very, very clear and you know, the government already gives numerous rights at the age of 16. You know, rights and you know, maybe I'll pick up on what Lachlan said. Lachlan said that the rights at 16 aren't important to society but I rather think the right to procreate and to start a family is the basis of society rather than simply a right that's not important. So I think, you know, voting at 16 is really important. And, you know, it's, it's a case of kind of pick your battles and which are the more winnable ones, I think, in this case. Thank you. <laughs> yep, this is the gentleman in the black T-shirt here. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> I got really confused. I was like, there's light. I don't understand. <laughs> but, yeah. To be honest, I'm not sure if I agree with this topic. Like, I agree in theory that it should be at 16, but I'm not sure if most 16 years would be ready for that. Because I know that we've got a lot of political young people here, and young people that are clued in are a really great and strong force in society, one of probably the most powerful politically if we all got involved. But I think if you wanted to change the law, if you wanted to lower the voting age to 16, we'd really need to improve a lot of education about what is politics, what are the parties? What does voting mean? How is it going to make a difference if I vote for the ones with the blue or the red or whatever? To basically make sure people understand what they're voting for, who they're voting for, and why it makes a difference. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to make a point as well? Do you want to come forward? Um, Craig Cochran, LGBT of Scotland. Um, just to pick on what Grant was saying, um, I think... Um, it is about education. If, we are, if young people are educated, then they should be given the right to vote at 16 um, for the fact that they can get married, they can go and go into the army and stuff. Um, I, it really annoys me when people say that 16-year-olds aren't, um, aren't responsible enough because I've, I know plenty of 40-year-olds that aren't responsible enough, yet they get votes that they get the vote. 
um, in there, out there committing crimes and stuff. Um, whereas there's really positive 16 year old and over kind of um, people like in this room who do good things but are overlooked because of their age. I mean, what, what would you recommend that we do to take a step towards that? Because obviously the last, in the last voting there was a massive percentage of young people who actually chose not to vote or didn't even know that the election was on. And something, I think it goes back to what you're saying, that how can we actually go back to informing that education? The Lady of the Red Hat, do you want to? Okay, um, I think um, the girl from the LGBT was, I can agree on a point about um, people not maybe going out to vote, but it's the right to choose to vote. I mean, people who are 40, they get the right and they get the choice and a lot of them don't turn out. And if we're talking about having more education within voting, if you have that age lowered to 16, it could be brought into schools and you could be taught how to vote. So then there's a lot more people out there um, actually knowing how to go out there and knowing the process. And then they maybe actually get a bit more enthusiastic about it and being more persuaded to actually go out and vote because then they'll be learning about why they're voting and more what sort of things when you vote like how it affects you. So if you're getting to do all this other stuff and you're not getting to choose like who gets to make the decisions for you, but you're still having to pay like taxes and everything else. So yeah, I think it's, I still you. agree with it. Mm -hmm. Again, stripy white shirt over here. I don't think we're on yet. Oh, there we are. Um, I'm Daniel Baker from Middle Day Youth Platform. And um, yeah, just, just to jump on the back of what they were saying, I was just thinking about the the education of voting, 16 year olds are still in school. So that there is a vehicle there for doing it. And in the run up to being 16, um, but why not take over, well not take over, but why not have sessions in um, PSC classes, bring in politicians, you know, and make links in order to get 16 year olds to vote. It's, it, it, I mean, people can leave school before they're 18, but everyone's there till they're 16. So you're gonna make some impression on all of them. I'm going to ask the two girls at the back to respond and then we're going to move to voting. So the girl in the dark jumper first. Um, I'd like someone to say um, no taxation. <laughs> <laughs> they say no taxation without representation. So surely if 16 year olds, 17 year olds are contributing financially to society, we should be allowed to vote on who's in charge to spend that money. That's There was another hand. Yeah, I think she's just waiting on her mic coming on. Um, I think everybody seems to be missing the point here. I don't think it's anything to do with what age you should be allowed to vote, anything about political education. Of course, that is a big factor in it, but I think everybody has to consider that politics is an interest, and if you want to get people interested, then you need to make it interesting. Well said. <laughs> okay, we've got time for one last. The, the chap in the chicken shirt, you're up. Hi there, uh, I can, uh, in my opinion, I disagree with the kind of voting age for 16 because, in my opinion, I think through my experience as I'm 20 years old, I think it's for young people to kind of vote at that age, they kind of need a bit more experience, but my alternative thought on it is if they were kind of given more experience about society and schools at secondary school, that could be another way for them to vote when they're 16, because I feel as if that there's kind of quite a lot of hung parliaments, and it's kind of quite import, important of the reality of the vote as well. So that's my opinion on it, but that may be in my constituency, where I'm MSYP for Airdrie Shots, where there's kind of a lot of Young people, it's one of the deprived areas, and some of the people hasn't got that type of experience where there is some that's got that, but I know the areas it's different, but that's my slant there for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I think now we're going to vote. 
Thank you very much for all coming forward and telling us what you think. Um, you can you sort of to vote by pressing the on button on the left hand side of your keypad. And the question that we are voting for, just to remind us all, is do you think lowering the voting age to 16 would help to address stereotypes of young people? Vote A for yes, B for no, and C for don't know. So everyone should vote now. Should we do a countdown, Sarah? Countdown then, and we need your help as well. So this doesn't normally get done in Parliament. Um, so we're going to do a countdown from three, two, one, and then we're going to reveal the answer. And that's for the rest of uh, you guys to finish your voting if you haven't done it already. Okay? So if you count with us, three, three two, one, vote. We go A. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So massive majority voting for yes, there. And I think for me personally, the thing that stands out is about making it interesting because it is an interest. And I think it's everybody in this room, it's our responsibility to play a part in making it interesting and making it accessible and exciting for other people that might not see that the way that we do. Yeah, and I think, um, I think what came out of, personally for me from, from that debate was that maybe even for some of the people that, that voted no, there's other ways that we, we can look at bringing politics into earlier into education. So again, echo what Lauren said, and it's kind of our responsibility as young people to, to make politics exciting and inviting for people. So, so thanks again for that debate. Okay, so we'd now like to invite Reardon Lang and Fortune, MSYP, to briefly speak for the topic of our second debate. And our second debate is that everyone, regardless of age, deserves to be paid a fair living wage. Reardon, would you like to speak? Yep. Afternoon, chaps. Uh, when, the af when the opportunity came to me to do the four speech for this, I was really passionate about it because it's something I feel strongly about and I know a lot of young Scots also feel strongly about it. Uh, currently in Great Britain, a young person can do the exact same job, the exact same amount of work, the exact same amount of hours as someone older than them and can be paid le legally less. 68%, that's two thirds of uni students in full-time employment, work longer than the 10 hours that's suggested. At the national minimum wage rate for 18 to 20 year olds, students would have to work 14 and a half hours to get the living wage amount of 10 hours. Imagine two people wait tables in a restaurant, one's a uni student and one's a gentleman in his 30s. If these two people work the exact same amount of work, the exact same job for 35 hours a week, the student would walk away with £336.44 pence less purely because of his age. Despite not only facing widespread condemnation from Britons, the UK government also faces international criticism due to its stance on equal pay rights. The situation is unjust, it is unacceptable and the existence of such a disparity is why I call upon you to vote for the motion. Hey, thank you very much, Reardon. We'd now like to invite Rachel McCauley to briefly speak against the topic for our second debate. Hi, guys. Um, why is it necessary for someone who's 16 to be paid the same wage as someone who is 30? The level of responsibility increases as you grow older, so therefore the level of pay should also increase, um, just so you can afford your, to pay for your living. At 16, the likelihood of having children, a house to maintain and other responsibilities is slim. So why do you need to be paid the same as older workers um, with greater responsibilities? 
Youth unemployment is already a massive problem in this country, and it will, it will only become greater uh, only become a greater problem if employers are forced to pay their workers um, higher earnings. Having the option to pay young people their um, own national minimum wage is an incentive for employers to employ inexperienced young people. I believe you are more likely to be employed on the basis of being paid less, which gives you greater employment opportunities for the two reasons I have just stated. I do not think it is necessary that young people should be paid the national minimum wage for over 21s. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've, we've now got about 15 minutes to debate for and against this, our second topic. So I'm going to ask the girl in the front with the body warmer, and then the lady at the end second, and then the guy with the pattern shirt third. Okay, um, just to pick up on something Rachel said, but kind of turn it on its side. Uh, she was discussing how young, like younger people, are chosen over, you know, um, more experienced older people in terms of like their skill because they get paid less. But I think, you know, that we should vote for this motion because it means it ends age discrimination and it means you get your job on the merit of um, of how good you are and how skilled you are rather than what age you are. And I think in general that would just make the economy just work so much better in terms of business because you've got people who are wanting to be there, are determined to be there, and are there because of their skill rather than their age. My name's Grant Strach and I'm from LGBT National Youth Council. Basically, just going back to what both the speakers for and against said, the first speaker said that a student at 18 would be paid a certain thing, a certain wage, which is less than a student and an adult of 30. And then Rachel, well, right, Gurren Redcap said that a 16-year-old doesn't have enough as much responsibility as an adult. The thing is, I'm at uni. I started uni when I was 16. So if I'm working the same hours as a mature student who's, say, 23, 24, why should I be paid so much less than them just because I'm young, younger? We've got the same requirement for both at university. So what's the difference? Hi, I'm Alan Wise of the Scottish Forest Youth Commission on Bullying. If a man and a woman of different ages got paid different, no, if a man and a woman of different ages got paid different wages, then it would be a massive fuss about it. And I don't see why this is the same for age. Why is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we take um, the, who's wearing the grey jumper at the back there? And then another grey jumper just over here, please. Hi, I'm Callum Stott from Fife Youth Radio. Um, one of my friends is 15 and works uh, doing sort of dishes um, in a restaurant. He gets paid just over two pounds, I think it is. I wouldn't work for that, really. I think that's. I think uh, even an older worker, say even 16, might be paid two pound more. And I think it's. I think it's quite a disgrace how someone could work for so less just because of age. He still does the same job. He still puts in as much work as he can. He's doing different sort of projects alongside like the radio we're all we're all part of the radio we we do it for no wage but we feel we feel that young people even 14 15 if you could work i think there should be a national women a national minimum wage and i feel very strongly about that we just take the uh, the gentleman just uh, the great jump over here although in the against speech, you said chances are slim for a child or a person of 16, 17 to have a family. We're in times where it's becoming more and more likely that a 16 year old is going to have a child. And by giving them lesser wage, we're forcing that child into child poverty, which is an increasing problem. So surely having an equal minimum wage that will make sure that child poverty decreases, which has become such an evident problem in especially Glas places like Glasgow and where a case study for child poverty across the world. Surely this will help reduce that horrid problem. Can we take a, 
turquoise cardigan, Lydia's turquoise cardigan, and then uh, just afterwards, the gentleman with the blue t-shirt. Hi there, I'm Caitlin McDowell, I'm an MSYP, but I'm here today with Dumfries and Gallery Council. In theory, I think this is a great idea, but in the real world, I don't know if it would work that well. Shouldn't a job, the wage you get with a job, be based on the skill of the job rather than the age you are? Because, to be quite honest, I don't expect, I do a paper run. I'm an MSYP, I can't juggle a job, school, and a everything else so I do a paper run and I get £3.60 an hour I'm happy with that it's a paper run I wouldn't expect £6.08 an hour do you know what I mean it should be based on skill not your age thank you <laughs> just take the gentleman in the blue t-shirt yeah, Adam Wilson, uh, I'm an MSYP but I'm also here with him for Security Council uh, I usually agree with Caitlin on things but I don't think it's fair I just know I'm looking for a job, you know, going to uni uh, in a few years' time, so I could do with some savings. Um, the job that would be suitable for me and the hours that would be suitable for me, I could look at getting paid £60 for the week. Um, although, for that, I need to take off the tax. I need to take off my bus fare. Coming from Dunfries and Galway, bus fares are quite extortionate for short journeys. So I could look at being left with only £40 a week. How is that fair for somebody like me? Can I just throw up a point I think that Rachel made that we actually we've kind of missed in this, this debate um, for and against minimum wage um, about youth unemployment so I know that may be an unpopular suggestion um, but with a lack of jobs does um, not having a minimum minimum wage help youth unemployment just to throw that out there with a couple more points so maybe if we can take uh, the golf the red jumper up there um, and then just afterwards the gentleman with the brown jacket um, a point was raised at the very beginning about how the lower wage for young people gets more young people employed because the employers are interested in less wages being paid out. And I think I find it quite odd that nobody's raised the point that that raises more opportunities for young people. More young people can get involved in employment, they can get part-time jobs while they're at school. And I think having that money is at least better than having no money at all. And I don't see why we're all moaning to get higher wages because... At least we've got the opportunities there. I think it's a very valid point. Um, just the gentleman in the brown jacket over here. George Todorovsky, Aberdeen City Youth Council. The question is, who has experience here? No one from us, so we can be paid less than one pound per hour. That's why there's minimum wage. Because some people like me, I'm a student, I have to work for my accommodation, for food, etc. And we need that. I am paid five pounds per hour, and my friends and job are paid six because they are not this, because they are more than 21. It's not fair. And if you say about economy, and it's better to hire young to for experience for him and they're less paid, it's not the solution. The solution is that the government supports both that to hire young people, but not harm young people that they get less money for their job. Thank you. Just take the girl with the bracelets at the front. Hi, I'm Lauren. I'm from North Lancashire Youth Council. Um, I'm kind of got like two sides to this because as a young person, I've been trying to find a job and it's like completely impossible. So I don't know whether like like having a living wage would kind of make that even more restricted because like less jobs would be available, kind of thing. If employers are having to pay higher. But at the same time, I think it's really important when we try to target poverty and as bills are getting higher and like shopping bills are getting higher, everything's getting higher and higher to pay for, then the things we work for need to be able to pay. Do you know what I mean? We need to have money to live. So, I don't know. It's like two sides. <laughs> <laughs> yep, can we just take gentleman in the blue t-shirt there? Um, personally, I think that considering how the national minimum wage, uh, we don't even ha like have one for our age, that I think if we did have one, that it would make work much more appealing and that might tackle the like idea of like, youth unemployment, that maybe more jobs will open for us and that will get better paid. So may maybe there will be more competition for it, but that's the point. Um, yeah. Thank you. 
Just to throw another point out as well, I mean, if we um, allow employers uh, to pay, pay anything, pay a pound, pay 50 pence, pay three pounds, um, do you think that, as a young person, that you will be less respected? It's just another point to kind of, kind of throw out. And also, I think, another thing to think about, we're using the word experience a lot, and maybe we need to question, what is experience? There's certain organisations that are actually bringing in young people to teach their older staff how to do things like social media. So your skills and your ideas and your enthusiasm and creativity is actually something that is worth, worth paying for and worth a lot of money. And maybe having the scale of seeing experiences age is maybe not the right thing, but it could, could, be, could be the right thing. So there's uh, two hands up over here, just a uh, gentleman on the left there with a kind of black tank top on. <laughs> Hi there, Chris Chapman, MSYP for Aberdeen South and Northern Carden. Um, I'm 24, I'm in full-time work, and I uh, earn above the minimum wage for my age group. Um, the question that I was wanting to really raise um, is to the uh, speaker in favour of the motion uh, is the basis that we're, we're confusing an issue here. We're talking about a living wage according to the motion. It's not the same as the national minimum wage. A living wage is talking about, and Aberdeen City Council do it, it's uh, roughly about, and Edinburgh's looking at doing it as well, which is a £7.20 um, minimum wage per hour for their employees within Edinburgh City Council, and I think Aberdeen City Council as well. Um, and that is to cover the cost of living, which include all your accommodation, your food, your travel, your uh, council tax, which students don't have to pay. Um, and then the national minimum wage, which is less than that, um, and th there is uh, maybe some confusion within the debate chamber today of those two issues. Um, they are separate. They do mean different things, and they do contribute differently to day-to-day -day life. So maybe a bit of clarity from the, the speaker would be appreciated. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm making the point that at 16, you're able to leave school, you're able to go have your own home, you're able to support yourself and a family. And if you don't have the living wage, how are you expected to support a family? You could have a child. And this was brought up in the London with the MPs and their cleaners who had to look after their whole family. And they were, the support, they were supporting their entire family on below the living wage. And so it, how can you expect someone in Scotland to be able to do the same thing? Thank you. If I could just clarify, um, the motion I wrote the speech for is slightly changed, so that's why it might be causing a bit of confusion. Also, I'd like the point that was made a while ago about we should be thankful to, for the small amount of money we can get is a bit Daily Mail, if I may say so, it's sort of thing. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I knife crime. Oh, that'll toughen them up. Yeah, I, oh, the slave labour. Well, it gets them out of the house. It's not really a proper argument to make. Like, you can't say... <laughs> You can't make someone work for 10 hours and then go, oh, well, there's your two pence. It's not, it's not right at all. Thank you. Well, I, think it's, I think it's only fair that we let you respond to that. Yeah. Take a deep breath. For... <laughs> um, in response, I would like to firstly say I am a very left-wing socialist, so please don't... Um, whatever the word is to the Daily Mail. Um, secondly, I'm not talking about equality of wage. I'm talking about equality of opportunities. Young people do not have the same opportunities of people with more experience, but we're not expected to get experience anywhere, anywhere else than getting a job. So if we have the lower wages and employers are more inclined to employ young people because of the lower wages, then we get experience which then leads on to better opportunities because we've got that experience, better things for our CV, which means we're then getting higher wages later on in life when they're saying, well, look what they've done, they've travelled up the career ladder. Thank you. So we just take, um, take the, the, the guy in the checkered shirt again and then uh, Rachel just afterwards to answer. Uh, you said that it's about equality of opportunity. Well, if you go and talk to any employer... They don't hire someone because they can pay them slightly less. They hire someone based on their experience, their skills, you know, all of the things like that. And actually, you know, in, in basic economics, your economic worth is not based on your age. Your economic worth is based on your skills, eh, all of these kind of things. And, you know, the, the national minimum wage laws at the moment were set in place by government. You know, what, why, why shouldn't young people, you know, if they are highly skilled young people, why shouldn't they 
deserve at least £7.20 an hour, at least, rather than age. And actually, you know, when I'm, I'm away for an interview in, you know, tomorrow, I'm, I'm going to be up against people who are, you know, in their late 20s and all that sort of thing. The employer isn't sitting there thinking, well, he's 18, I can pay him a bit less. The employer is sitting there thinking who is best to fill that job. Opportunity isn't decided on your wage, opportunity is decided on how good you are for that job. Rachel, we've got about 10 seconds, so if you just want to respond to that really, really quickly. Okay, um, just come to the point about experience. Um, it's not, getting a job is not always how you get experience. You can do things through volunteering and through many other different programmes. So I don't believe saying you can only get experience through a job, because I don't believe that's true at all, because there's many other things that can give you that sort of experience. Thank you. Okay, so we're just out of time there, I'm afraid. I know that's quite a, a hot topic. Um, so thank you again, uh, both speakers, for your contributions and for everybody else taking part in that. It's now time um, to vote. So we're voting on the topic of everyone, regardless of age, um, deserves to be paid a fair living wage. So that's A, if you agree with it, B, if you disagree, and C, if you don't know. And we're going to give you about 60 seconds to vote, so if you please do that now. Okay, so an obvious winner there, and thank you all for giving your opinions. And we really like to see actual ideas coming through as well as opinions and insights, because what we need to be talking about are ideas and solutions to these things, because we're all really good at knowing what's wrong and talking about what the problems are and getting quite passionate about that. But what we really need are ideas to solve things. So it was really good to see some of them, some of them coming through. So. We'd now like to hand you over to Gina Clark, who is going to lead us in an energizer break. And this is optional. You can use this as a comfort break, or you can stay here and be suitably energized. I'm not really sure that it's going to be I'm that energizing, but we'll go for it. Uh, so yeah, you can, thank you very much, that was really good. Um, yeah, you can go for a break if you want to go for a break, if, um, to go to the toilet, this should be quite fun. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to look under their seats, there should be a sheet of card, purple or white. Now, what I want everyone to do is, everyone on this side, if you're able, can you move into the middle? so that everybody is in this middle section. Sorry, I'll stand here and then I'm right in the front and then I can... Sorry, do you want to stand in front of you? Um, so if you're in this section here, if everyone moves so they're in this section of the chamber... This. <laughs> do you like that? <laughs> nah, I do fancy singing. I might, put, I might put the gallery people off if I start singing. Oh, sorry, everyone who's on this side, if they can all move into this section, anywhere in this section. And could you all stand up? Now, I'm going to be a bit of a pain and ask people who think they're tall to go to the back and people who think they're sh shorter to come to the front. I don't want to offend anyone with that comment. If you feel you're shorter, you come to the front. If you th feel you're taller, go to the back. Right. 
Right, second. Right. Right, so the next part of this is everyone holding a white sheet of paper. The idea is to make this. Okay? So, everyone with a white piece of paper, I'm going to ask you to make the cross in the middle. So the back marker is going to be the second row down, right at the end. Second row down, right at the end. The front of the cross will be here and will be here. So if everyone has white sheets, if they could make the cross right across, with two, 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 and two, you can be the wee bit in the middle. Aye, that's the idea. Yeah. How are we going to do like two, 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 Right, they're going to switch to live feed so that you can see what it looks like. And you can tell me if it looks like a saltar. <laughs> I very much do it too. So, <laughs> you look at this and you arrange yourselves in order. Right, so white needs to go from that corner right down the middle to this corner. And white needs to go from this corner right up to that corner. Do you know what? If everyone moves forward a bit, I think that might help. So if you come down a tier. So if there's people in front and behind the rows, if they can, or two people in each row, it might bring it down a bit. Because you've sort of got it, but it's spread. Yeah. There's a bit of white missing in that section. There's a, bit, uh, there's a whole lot of white missing in that section. A lot, a bit longer than 15 minutes, we think. So, right. if everyone just moves forward, if, can everyone move? No, 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 Kyle, no, lean forward, move forward. Thank you. He's have got it easy. You, I must say, this section here is looking pretty good. So if this, oh sorry, this section here is also looking not too bad. <laughs> that section there isn't too good. And that section there is getting there. like a hundred purple right there. <laughs> right, can some of that purple in here move down into the sections? Because there's, there's a lot of purple. What is it looking like? Does it look anything like a salt air? Some people are like sort of and some people are like no. Yeah. Uh, we're get, we're, it looks it looks alright. I guess. There's a row there's a row of white. Right, someone point out the row of white to me. Curly hair guy. Ryan, Ryan, that that curly hair guy there, that's mine. He's, he's a member of my group, right, Ryan? You're not show, showing a good example. <laughs> we discussed this this morning. Can you please move into one of the diagonal lines? Diagonal? Right, how are we looking now? Right, I'll squeeze in this way. I'm 
sorry, I'm sorry to see this all the time. You maybe can't see it from up there. But it's kind of like it's like so. Right, if you all turn your, your paper slightly tilted, so they're pointing up at that camera, which I don't know where it is. Which one? One that's moving. That one. That one, right? If you all turn them slightly towards there, it might look better. Right, okay, we've got like a dodgy white one. That white one right there, behind you, Jordan. That, sorry, you move slightly forward into the middle. Jordan, swap places with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely. That looks better. Sorry. There's, I know, I know what's going on here. You see this section here? This section here is not, it's not diagonal, that's what it is. Right, um, see the, sorry, the three that are sitting, white, 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 three, yeah, you, sorry. Can you go diagonally up there and join in with that back row? Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, that back row shouldn't all be in a line. You should be diagonally down. <laughs> They're all in a row right along the top. They need to be like down here. Caitlin, please could you come down into like the second row just to make it more diagonal? This is funny. <laughs> right, go and turn your paper again, like up that way, so that I can see it. Um, oh, it's, it looks good. Looks good. That's as good as we're going, eh? What? More purple in the front. More purple in this bit. Right, can some of the purple at the back come down to here? A couple of you. Yay! Sorry, Jordan's coming. Sorry, I know some of your names, obviously. I don't know other people's names. You can shout me. It's all good. Yay! Right, that looks like a solitaire flag. Does that not? Any other tweaks we want to make? Right, we need to hold it. Hold it above your heads. No, it's all right. Where's the picture being taken from? In front of your faces. And slightly tilted. It looks better if it's tilted. It looks sort of like a sofa. Yeah, I see what you mean. You see this this group still got an issue in this corner. You aren't really straightly diagonal. pictures taken well you are in a minute so if there's any final tokens you you know you could help each other help each other and move each other and have a wee chat about yeah. 
Это слышно? They've suggested we sing a Scottish song while we wait. Does anyone know a decent Scottish song of fancy singing? No good words. Oh, you can't even shove your granny off a bus. Oh, you can't even shove your granny off a bus. So if you can all tilt it slightly, so yeah, yeah, you go for it. Okay, um, that was awesome. I, I think I'd like to see that at the start of um, every every parliament. <laughs> <laughs> MSPs doing it. Um, so what, um, while you guys were doing that, and we were being a little bit lazy and just sitting here, um, we thought we were thinking about what would be the cool things that we can do in parliament that we don't normally get to to do. And we thought one of them would actually be to do a proper Mexican wave right round and back again. So we want to give it one shot and get this on film. And you, so are you ready for it? So if we start with. Um, this bunch in the back, if you guys want to kick it off, and then we'll go all the way back, and then go back round again, okay? So we give, a, give these guys a countdown to help them, because they're a little bit slow. You ready? So three, two, one, go! <laughs> back! Come back! <laughs> a moment in history that people will write books about and stuff in 20 years so well done okay so great so let's um get back to to business really um now that we're all energized let's make our last debate kind of like really exciting and really think about um some ideas that we can we can challenge the motion with okay so i'd now like to invite uh, Kyle Thornton, MSYP, to briefly speak for the topic for our last debate, which is those who commit antisocial behaviour offences in town centres should be banned from them for three weeks. So, Kyle, if you want to step forward. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I just uh, liked on the motion. The motion actually mentioned uh, alcohol and uh, people being arrested for being drunk and disorderly. Just thought to point that out in case you think my speech is a wee bit off topic. In Scotland, in 2007 alone, the abuse of alcohol costs our economy, police, NHS and councils more than £4 billion. Scotland has a drink problem. It's recognised at all levels of government and society, and it's been recognised for a long time. But so far, nothing's worked. Scotland has the eighth highest alcohol consumption level in the world. In one year alone, Scotland drank 50 million litres of pure alcohol. Not only are we suffering horrendous health consequences, but we are seeing more and more crimes related to alcohol. Across the UK, there were 986,000 crimes where alcohol played a factor. And in Scotland, in 62% of all violent crime, the offender is under the influence of alcohol. It's not just violent crime, though, that alcohol is a factor. Arrests for being drunk and disorderly in town centres are increasing. These are people who are just going too far and causing trouble while well drunk to have to be arrested. But what can we do about it? One solution is to serve a three-week town centre pub and club ban on those arrested for being drunk and disorderly. This would act as a deterrent to stop people going too far and hopefully to practice some self-restraint. Now, I've got nothing against people who want to go out and have a good time. I don't think anybody does. But if you're so drunk and causing so much trouble, you have to be arrested. So have some time out to think about your actions. If you imagine the amount of people in Glasgow City Centre, for example, on a Saturday night, you have to be in a real state to actually be arrested for being drunk. The ban would not only benefit the person by giving them time to reflect on their relationship with alcohol, but would benefit those who live in town centres across Scotland. Friday and Saturday nights can be a real nightmare for them. The majority accept drunken people as a part of the location, but no one should have to put up with antisocial behaviour on their doorstep. They deserve tough action on crime to make sure they feel safe in their communities. Scotland's got a problem with drink. We're honest with ourselves and we're world leading in trying new ways to tackle the problem. We're the first in Europe to try minimum pricing and I believe we should also be world leading in trying to cut down crimes under the influence of alcohol using the ban proposed. We should be bold, aim high and make Scotland's town centres safer for all at night. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Karen. Thank you for clearing up the motion. It, it is actually focused on being drunk and disorderly, so thank you for that. Um, I'd now like to invite Nairn MacDonald, MSYP, uh, to briefly speak against the topic for our last debate. Hello. Um, the Social Exclusion Unit said that the main factor for offending and reoffending, whether drunk or not, is education. All this motion does is stop some antisocial behaviour for three weeks. And when many young people only go out onto the town once a month, is that all they can afford? This doesn't really affect the area. But as Kyle said, it would reduce it. But somebody that gets a ban from being in Glasgow City Centre, it's not going to stop them going down the town in the local village. Work and many reports suggest that prevention is the key. We need to stop our young people committing the offence in the first place. We need to work at grassroots level to stop this in all areas, as all areas will have a different approach. We need to work with local pubs and clubs to isolate the more likely to be the troublemakers in the future. This motion is too soft, too little and too weak. Although I believe in prevention, I also believe that if a young person has the education and the knowledge to know better about alcohol, that we should crack down hard. Them being stopped going to one town centre or one area will not stop them going to another area and doing it all over again. There should be a fine or a ban from a complete area or constabulary, anything to have a lasting effect. We need to work with community police officers and pinpoint troublemakers or troubled areas and intervene before it gets bad. This motion, although it addresses the immediate problem, does nothing to address the long-term problem that we have. Yes, a three-week ban for one person from a town is going to maybe stop them drinking in the town. It won't stop them going home and having a carry-out. It won't stop them getting drunk at home. It's not going to do anything to stop them drinking at home. We must work with councils and governments alike to pinpoint areas of concern and that require action. We need to develop a healthy and appropriate prevention strategy. And though that and through that and not this motion, 
I believe that we will reduce antisocial behaviour through junk and disorderly over the next years. This, the motion itself only targets specific areas, and I think it would be extremely hard to enforce. You've been banned from a town centre. They're not oh, they're going to take your picture, carry you around, your picture around in their back pockets so they know when you are sent out to every pub. It's not logical to enforce it. So I thank you for listening, and I hope that you support me in voting no against this motion. We need to tackle antisocial behaviour, but this is not the right way to do it. Thank you. OK, so we've got lots of hands up for this one. We're going to go with the chap in the army T-shirt, then the chap on the front with the black suit, and then the boy on the end with the blue jumper. OK, so chap in the brown jacket, do you want to go first? It does. Now it's better. Firstly, what do you mean by club ban? We have clubs, pubs, restaurants, and shops. You can buy alcohol in the shop. Are you going to forbid people to go into the shop to buy food or whatever? And secondly, about minimal prices. Now I don't buy a bottle of wine. Now I buy a bottle of Lambrini. It's cheaper. And secondly, maybe something from history. In Poland, during communism, we also had very high prices of alcohol. In fact, people started to produce own alcohol, which was definitely worse than a famous growth. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there we go. Cheers. Um, my name is Jordan Linden, I'm the MSYP and I'm also from North Lanarkshire Truth Council. First of all, I hope Kyle isn't speaking from experience when he mentions the state of people in Glasgow City Centre. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that people shouldn't be banned from town centres for antisocial behaviour. I believe that a greater level of rehabilitation and programmes to educate people and offenders that this behaviour isn't acceptable would be a far better deterrent as they don't want to sit through it at the end of the day. Okay, chat with you. Army t-shirt on. I think this would be difficult to actually administrate since, as he said earlier, uh, this would be costly just to keep an eye on who's actually been banned. You'd have to, uh, he could just go to the next pub. In cities, there could be hundreds of people that have committed these crimes and uh, are banned from that area. So how will you be able to keep an eye on all hundreds of them that have been banned? Will you be having police constantly checking there 24 hours a day or the whole time the pubs are open? Okay, does anybody have an alternative solution? So instead of banning from the town centre, a solution that could be an alternative to that? Okay, so if we have the guy in the, the white shirt, the boy down the front in the black t-shirt and then the girl in the body warmer, the chap in the white shirt, do you want to tell us your solution? Uh, hi, I'm John. I'm from Chris Galley Council, your strategy executive group. I think your solution is uh, education. You know, our parents drank, our grandparents drank, their grandparents drank. It's a culture thing. And I think in order to tackle it, there needs to be better education in schools, tackle it younger, first, second year, even primary six and seven, uh, especially in larger cities and towns. I'm coming from a, a small town, a smallish town, and there's a lot of people, young people, going out and drinking and stuff. And it is a problem, but it's not just in the town centre. You know, they go at parks, they go up streets that police don't often check, especially at night. And on Friday, Saturday night, because the police are, do concentrate in the town centre. So there's a lot that goes on without, the t you know, out with the town centre. And I think the priority is education, especially when it goes to parents and grandparents. You know, because if you've got a whole generation of family that drinks, the likelihood is that you'll end up drinking as well. OK, do we have any parents in the, in the chamber that could respond to that? You have a parent at the back. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, my, um, my name is Eileen Rogers from um, New Strategy Executive Group from Fusing Galloway Council. Um, as a, both as a parent and working with a group of young people, it's, I've got sort of two different sides to it um, because um, you turn you turn up uh, not turn a blind eye, but you. you you don't judge the young people if they're coming out and talking about the problems that they're having with alcohol. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to, to be able to try and um, teach my young people about being responsible as well until I end up going to a wedding myself. 
and there's free-flowing champagne and there's all everywhere and I end up um, getting drunk myself and it's very difficult to do that. You're sitting there with your children, you're teaching them not to drink uh, or to drink responsibly and then it doesn't matter what age you are, there are still occasions where you have one drink too many. So no matter how many times I've been educated, there is an occasion where, where you do that but it's about trying to um, be safe so, um, th yeah, there is a bit more about that. And I think it's about young people are the ones who need to um, be talking to themselves mm. and not having older people telling them not to drink. It's about learning together from a younger age. Um, and I would agree with John as well, though, about if you are, you know, you've got your grandparents and your, your mum and dad, um, it is very difficult if it's learned behaviour. But I think the young people now are the ones that can make a difference. So. Thank you. Maybe we could safely clap until the end so that we can, so more people can speak. We can have one big clap at the end. Scott Lavin, NSYP for Coatbridge and Chryson. I'd just like to say that recently my area has been shown as the highest death rate with alcohol consumption. So this is kind of a topic that does affect me and my area. But I agree with what John and Nairn were saying because it is something they've grown into. It's something they've seen their older brothers and sisters, their parents doing. And it's not really been shown to them the repercussions of it how somebody might be in hospital for months at a time. It's shown that it'll go out, they'll have a good time, and then tomorrow morning they might have a hangover. But they have to show them like, what will happen in the long run. It's not all about having a good time when you can have liver problems, things like that, for the rest of your life. So it's about showing them what will happen. So how, how would you do that? How do you show young people what the long-term repercussions are? Do you want to... I'm not sure you Do you want to just stand up to the microphone, John? I'm just kind of looking for a bit of clarity on what it means from being banned from a town centre. Like, I don't, I don't quite know what that means. Does it mean just the pubs and clubs, or does it mean like shops and post offices and everything like that? Just when I first read it, I was a bit confused as to what's actually going on, especially for someone who lives in Edinburgh City, where it is just one city, and I can't like be banned from anywhere because <laughs> everybody would be banned from a flat. I think it's pubs and clubs. Is that? <laughs> Okay, but I think um, we need we need to we're getting back into why this is important and why it's a problem and moving away from alternative solutions. Um, so, are all the hands up? Actual solutions. We can have the girl in the blonde here with the at the front, and then the guy in the white t-shirt at the back. I think it's like a case of you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Like you can educate people so many times, and you can give them so much advice and show them all the consequences. But if they want to drink, they're going to go out and do it. As, like if they're going to get banned for three weeks, the next day after they've finished their ban, then they're going to go back out and drink again. If they want to drink, then that's what they're going to do. The only solution is to actually punish them properly. Like by if they're obviously causing so much trouble, then they're a troublemaker. They shouldn't be out in the streets. They should be getting punished as community services to get something like more punishable so they actually learn from their cons like learn from the consequences. Because like no matter how many times you educate people, they're still gonna recommit if they want to recommit. If they want to drink, they're gonna drink. You can't force them not to. But, but surely as the lady said, I'm sure all of it well, I know that we can say that it does happen every now and again in one time in your life you do have one drink too many and you learn from it. Now if we all got put in jail the night that, that happened. No, I don't even like that. I mean like if people like, like keep on doing it. Like, if people keep on, like, if they're the people that are like troublemakers every week, out gets like drunk and cause trouble every week, and police are constantly picking up their names, picking up like putting them in the cells on a Friday night and they're back out by the Monday. Do you know what I mean? They should like, why should something better not be done to punish them to stop them? Because that's obviously wasting so much police time if police are picking up the same troublemakers every weekend. So like, why should they keep on doing it? Like a three week ban, the next day they're going to be out, or they're going to be in their house drinking anyway. Do you know what I mean? There's so many other ways that they'll still be able to get a drink if they want to get a drink. Can I throw this one out there? Is it, I mean, is the problem that uh, there's, there's nothing to do? Is it boredom? Is that, is that why we, you know, to question why we drink? I see you shaking your head there in the blue t-shirt. Do you want us to stand up? Thank you. Uh, this is an issue that's really close to my heart, um, and it was our group who put it in. Um, I live in the town centre. I've recently moved there. Um, and it's quite a big town centre, it's not huge. And every Friday, Saturday and Sunday night, it is absolutely horrendous. It is like riots outside my house. I, mean, I don't even live in like a really bad area. And people are being assaulted left, right and centre. People can't walk, they're being sick. It is disgusting. And it's not young people. Well, it's not only young people. 
to this some young people, but it's not just young people. So education, doing education, you're not going to get a 25-year-old. Like, how are you going to educate them? So I, I, I totally disagree with being about education. The other thing is, is saying that it can't be policed. Well, it can be policed because they do it in England. They give you a ban in England at night. If you're, you know, causing too much trouble, they'll tell you to go home. And they'll tell you not to come back for 24 hours. So they do police at other places. And I think um, that um, this wasn't really about trying to give young people a bad name. It was sort of trying to look at the whole solution of what could we possibly do to move it forward rather than just what's happening just now is you might get in trouble for one night, but then you'll come back the next night. And I can tell you it's the same people every single weekend that I see. It's not someone who's only out once a month because they've been paid. It's the same people every single weekend. And the police aren't doing anything about it. So... And I drink, and I go out, and I have a good time, and I don't end up being sick and smacking my friend in the face and coming home. You know, I can drink to, to be drunk, but not to be mm. stupid about it. So mm. something does have to be done about it, but, and I think a ban might stop people. I mean, I think the fact that it is the same people is something that's really important, and it's something that is, is not just happening around antisocial behaviour and alcohol. It's something that's happening in housing and drug use and lots of different areas. So maybe it's more about what those people need and want and what, what can help them. We talk about breaking cycles a lot. Like, what, how can we help those people break the cycles that they're in? So I only want answers that are focused on ideas and solutions and how to break the cycle for this last wee section. So I'm going to ask the girl in the check shirt in the middle of the three hands and then the chap in the white t-shirt. Um, personally, I don't think there is a right or a wrong answer for this. It's a very kind of diverse subject, but I think a very silly answer is a three week ban. If someone is silly enough to go out and drink as much as they do to get arrested, that's not going to stop them from doing it in the future, and it's not going to stop them from drinking. We need to have solutions that are simple, such as judgment in clubs. You have 18-year-olds serving other 18-year-olds, seeing how drunk they are, and still serving them more drink. That's, that is a problem. They should be able to use their judgment to think, this isn't going anywhere, this is just going to end badly. Also, we need to give the youth something to do with their time. What is there for the youth to do on a Friday, Saturday night, rather than go out and go out their face? There needs to be something brought up that the children can be more interested, that we can be more interested in, rather than go out and clubbing and partying. And I've, I've not seen the government doing anything about it. I've not seen anyone doing anything about it that's actually working. That's, it needs to be more interest for teenagers and for children. I think that's the simple solution, okay, or one you. of many. Thank you, guy in the white T-shirt. Hey, I'm Alexander McLeod and I'm from Highland Youth Voice and um, I don't think where I live in Wick in the far north, um, I don't think a ban would work completely or utterly. Um, we have a pub watch scheme which regardless of where the pub is in the town or the club, you're banned, I, I don't know the exact length of time but you're banned completely from every place which I think works well. I think it works well for smaller places because people know each other so if you were to walk in the bar you're banned from you'd obviously know you'd be chucked out. So I think that's a solution for smaller places. It's a complete ban of everywhere, if there was to be a ban, rather than a small um, confined area like a town centre. Thank you. Um, can we take... Uh, who's, who's not been... Uh, the chap just in the sort of green shirt at the back here? Do you want to... Yes, cool, all right. Chris Cromar, Scottish Youth Parliament, <clears throat> Aberdeen. Well, I personally think that Scotland should use the European countries, such as France and Italy, as examples to deal with our drinking culture. These countries, the people there don't go out to get drunk, but many of our citizens do. They enjoy a fine wine over a meal, which lasts a few hours. And I think it's very important to offer children from about 14, a glass of wine with a meal. I think that's what happened to me. And I think that is responsible. And I think they'll get used to drinking fine wine and they won't want to get out and get absolutely smashed because that's not a responsible way. And I think that's what Scotland should do to really curb this ill that we have in society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we take 
um, the guy in the blue t-shirt, because I can see you're really eager to say something there. Okay, um, first of all, for, the, for this motion, I think, although it's not going to make a massive, it's still going to make a step. And first of all, like, if they're banned, then maybe, maybe it's not, we might not be able to completely police it, but it will still make a difference. And then that means that there'll be a less, like, problem to the general public. So, like, you know, there'll be less chances of assault. And then I think the solution is that, yeah, we should socialise the drink. And I know also that won't make a massive difference, but it'll still make a step. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to do gradual build-up. We need to step forward and keep going forward. Thank you. There's quite, I mean, I think, um, as Naomi was saying, it's focusing on this idea of, of prevention, right? And we're talking about... Um, bit of education, looking at other countries, looking at the people who work in pubs and clubs. Um, and we can keep saying, yeah, let's educate young people about it, but there's a few disagreements in that. And I think I want to follow Lauren on this suit, that can we try to think of, like, tell us, like, what kind of things would actually make a difference rather than just generically saying we should educate young people, because we do, we already do do that. So can we take just a point down here from there? Um, well, I'd, personally, I'd do what I call the taxi driver method. If you throw up in a taxi, you're going to get charged 25 quid for it because it's for cleaning whatever. That sort of thing would work because for the one-time offenders, like, you know, everybody's done it, you go out, you drink far too much than you initially planned on, and then you're maybe sick or, you know, you get in a brawl or something, and you should be charged accordingly. Like, if it's just one time, you know, a £20 fine or something like that, but then, you know, if it is the repeat offenders, and you do get the repeat offenders, I mean, it'll be taken track of anyway, but they'll also find they've got a lot less money in their pockets to then go out and cause as much trouble as they have, because you would spend less money on drink because you're too busy paying your fines for the last time you were in a night out. Thank you. Um, can we take yeah, the gentleman in the tank top? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Chris Chapman, uh, Aberdeen South, Northern Carden, MSYP. Um, I agree with the previous speaker and the speaker that was up here. Um, it's kind of, it's looking at, you know, embarrassment is kind of the major thing. It's become a social norm now that getting drunk to a certain level is, is okay. It's fine. We've all seen our Facebook profiles of our, our nights out on the front. Friday, Saturday, hey, a Wednesday, um, and it's become a so, uh, it's become a social norm. Hey, it's true. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's become a social norm to get that drunk. It's okay, um, and there's that level of of embarrassment and uh, kind of going. You no, know, that's that level of responsibility within ourselves. Um, so solutions is what you were asking for. One way is to do that is that instead of maybe getting arrested and getting that criminal record, although that's a large deterrent behind it, is that the community service hours. What if you're the ones that are cleaning the streets the next morning? Or sometime in that week, you're the one that's cleaning the sick up, or the piss on the wall, or the, the litter that's been caused from the chip boxes all over the streets? What if it's, um, you know, we spent more money in advertising campaigns? How do you educate a 25-year-old? Well, if it's on a bus stop, and you're walking down the street, driving down the street, and you see billboard posters, advertisements of services on bus stops, TV, radio, the internet, are all advertising the bad effects of, of drinking or, or the embarrassment of someone that's looking an idiot on the street. It's that, that getting that social norm back to a level that it is not okay to get that drunk. And then that'll take the level of our universities that are organizing Freshers Week for the next few weeks, how many of them have got drink promotion sponsors? And what, what kind of service are they doing in terms of reducing the, the cost of alcohol that they will be serving then to the new freshers, the new students? And it's that mentality from, again, pubs and clubs that, you know, maybe we should be doing something differently to approach the, the new students, the new generation of young people, to say it is not okay to get that drunk. Yeah, but I think it the... Really... Thank, thank you for your point, and you've, that is an optional solution, and I think that it's great that we're focusing more towards that now. But in my mind, it's like even if you do spend millions of pounds on a campaign, there always is, there's always going to be somebody richer that owns a TV channel that is showing alcohol and being drunk and smoking as something glamorous and beautiful. And you're seeing the people that you idolise or people that you respect in newspapers and on the television doing it as well so that's if you're going to go down that route it's a really difficult battle to win because there's always somebody richer who wants to be richer rather than doing it for the right reasons and I think what really interests me is looking at it 
as a personal responsibility thing, like you said, everybody changing your mindset. And the smoking ban is a fantastic example of that. And it's actually the, somebody said to me, it's the lowest cost motion that's ever gone through Parliament and the most successful one. These things shouldn't need massive resources and finance. What they need is everybody to get behind it. And no matter where you are in Scotland, if somebody smokes where they're not meant to, somebody else always says, excuse me, you're not allowed to do that. So it's policing itself, it's happening by itself because we all take responsibility for it as citizens. And I'm interested in what the equivalent of that would be for what we're talking about here. Not that you can say you're too drunk, you have to go home to somebody you don't know, but what, but what would that look like if we all had that attitude when we did go out on a Friday night? Okay, so we're going to go with the chap with the curly hair in the middle. And who's not spoke? The chap up the very back in the black T-shirt and the girl next to Rachel in the red hat. Hi there, my name is Ryan Sturrock and I'm from the Midlothian Youth Platform. And my, my point is that I think a lot of the responsibility should come from the people who are who are in charge of the pubs and the clubs and the people who are working behind the bar. And something I think is a really, a really interesting point that most of you probably have never heard of is a Gothenburg pub. Now, pubs that follow the Gothenburg principle are pubs that put all the profits back into the community and also follow a set of guidelines that say that if you're getting beyond a certain point of drunkenness, you'll be asked to leave. And the, and the pubs and the, the other pubs and clubs in the local area will be told about you and you'll be banned from them for a set period of time. So I think it's all to do with actually placing it in the actual venue itself. And obviously you can't do that in your house, but I think more should be done by the people who are running the pubs. Thank you. Well, the guy at the back in the black T-shirt. Cameron from South Ayrshire Reform. It's just like, um, currently there's a system in South Ayrshire Police where if you get caught underage with alcohol, you have three times to put, get your name put in the book. The first time you'll receive a warning, your drink will be taken off you and you'll be asked to go home. And the second time you'll be sent home directly and your parents will be consulted. And third, you'll be put in jail um, overnight until your parents can find an ideal solution, whether it be rehab or whatever. And I think that system has to be in place for adults because the best way to actually stop something is by making an example and making sure that they don't do it again. So I think that's the most appropriate punishment for anyone because if it works with young people, it'll work with adults because that's what we eventually grow up to and we all think alike like that. Okay, girl in the middle. Um, hi, it's Ashley from Aberdeen City Youth Council, as you see I've suited up. Um, you were talking about the smoking campaign earlier, and as much as a successful campaign, we did manage to implement that it's illegal to um, drink in public places, and you can only drink in responsible situations, which is fair enough. But obviously, I think we need to talk more about the health issues that are connotations with alcohol, because that does deter people. It may not deter everyone, but it has an impact to some extent. Can we take the girl over here? Because I know you've had your hand up for a really long time in the white top. Hi, uh, I'm Emma Mason from Midlothian Youth Platform. The thing, the quote that's on the board is antisocial behaviour. Uh, so antisocial behaviour is not just uh, being drunk and disorderly on public places. It also includes things like um, street racing and vandalism. So basically, if you were caught street racing in your local town, then yeah, you should be banned from being driving about in that town again at nights at the weekend. Because I know where I live, it's not being drunk and disorderly. It is the vandalism. It's people coming down your street, kicking your car windows off and smashing your car windows. It's people driving about boy racing. And yeah, I think that would be brilliant, them saying, look, right, okay, you're not allowed where you were caught boy racing or being vandalism because it is, and it is the same people that come repeatedly because they know that they can't get caught in that street. And the amount of times in my street that we have reported all this vandalism, um, the boy racing and that, and the, the police know that they're there, but they don't come. So I think the police need to take more responsibility of where these things are happening and having the time to maybe go and check them out when it is happening because they're coming round at the wrong times and they don't, they're not seeing what we see as the residents. 
Have you tried to talk to the police about that idea? My mum's a police officer and she's tried to. And what, what's their kind of response to that? I mean, they're try they have, like, they've started trying to sort of... They're getting better, but, I mean, it's, it is education as well. Like, they're, they're only getting slaps on the wrists. There needs to be harsher punishments for if you're caught. Like, the three times offences for, like, being caught drunk is the same in Midlothian as well, because there was people at my high school that were caught as well, and it was the three times offences. That needs to be rolled out for all antisocial behaviour orders, not just for being caught drunk. And I think a lot of people have so talked about being drunk on the streets, but you need to remember it's antisocial behaviour in general. Thank you. Can we take um, the guy in the blue T-shirt here, um, the guy in the checkered shirt up here afterwards? Yeah, Adam Wilson, MS5P in the Racing Gallery Council. Um, I'm just wanting to say about, you know, obviously saying about um, ban from town centres. The cost of enforcing that law would be very high, and I'm thinking that we could use that somewhere else. Um, education isn't working. We've been telling, you know, young people not to uh, drink, you know, so many agents of alcohol a week. It's not working. I don't know how many times I've seen the same PowerPoint, you know, a bottle of vodka's got X number of units of alcohol, you know, and the police say, oh, we'll give you a new PowerPoint, okay? and it's the same one, and... It switches me off for a period, and it switches everyone else off as well. That money could be spent on updating technology that police use in education and making it a bit more interactive, making it a bit more fun. Um, more alcohol recovery schemes that could be used by the NHS, not only for young people, but for older people as well, um, who are possibly starting to realise that actually exceeding alcohol limits is affecting their health. And also as well, I was really shocked to find out that popular youth centres in my area were closed on a Saturday and Sunday. I think that if we spent money opening these youth centres at the weekend, you know, more on a Saturday, then actually it would tell young people there's another option. You don't have to go out and drink. You could come to the youth centre, spend time with your friends without drink uh, and with a can of Coke or Pepsi instead. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. I think that's quite a, um, yeah, thanks. A, a valid um, a point around the youth centres. We've just been doing a project actually in, in uh, Muir House in Edinburgh. I don't know if, if some of you are familiar with the area around um, a lot of antisocial behaviour being caused because there was nothing to do, as young people would put it. I mean, is that a general kind of agreed uh, idea amongst you guys? Is that, is that one of the big problems? Or We'll come to the guy in the checkered shirt at the back here and then maybe come back to that, that idea. Uh, hi again. Uh, I think uh, in my area, my constituency, again, for your drain shots, that's like one of the most uh, deprived areas still. And on addition, I agree with Scott Ramon's point, MSYP for Coat Bridge in uh, Christen, about what he thinks about alcohol, because unfortunately that is the reality about it, and it can be disappointing at times, but I think. Uh, whilst the right people's here within the chamber across uh, Scotland, the whole of Scotland, right, my uh, shout project, I think what we could do is can I think up solutions on that and why people drink alcohol. I've kind of got my own, uh, I know other people that's done it and have kind of got the, their kind of personal experiences and I think it's because, uh, frank, to be frank, people kind of can I get bored of them? And a lot of people can, uh, like schools and colleges, think that young people want to play, play like Xbox 360s and all that, but at the same time, in their PlayStations, and that's why they can uh, get cut off with jobs, and that's why they drink alcohol and take the use of it, and it's to kind of raise that awareness and let them can uh, see clearly uh, how that works, and that should prevent it, but also to kind of challenge your local councillors and go down to places like Citizens Advice and do that. That's my suggestion, but not only for myself, but for everybody in the chamber. Uh, thanks a lot for listening, and hopefully that progresses over the next year, but it kind of takes time to take effect. That's the truth, truth of that subject. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I mean, in order to have, I guess, with this, this motion, it, it, 
I mean, someone can, can challenge this, but it's quite focused on the police being the enforcers. And actually, is this more about communities working together, kind of in a more joined up approach amongst the police and social work, um, health authorities, schools to, to work together uh, to, in order for this prevention to happen? Is that, is that a better way of working? Um, can we have uh, just somebody who's not yeah, who's on before the girl in the cream shirt over here? I was just going to look back to the point that was made earlier about um, pa about sitting through class and PowerPoints of unit numbers, and we've all done it. We've sat through the PowerPoints and the videos and the worksheets, and that's part of the problem. They say, oh, people are already being educated, but the education, you don't remember any of it because it's not interactive. It doesn't catch your attention. If you had more sort of interactivity, discussing your opinions and your knowledge, it would stick in your mind more, and the education would actually be effective. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and it's something that goes across education. On Education's come up for every motion we've talked about, and sometimes it's all good and well to say educate, but it's more about how you educate and what that looks like in terms of slides or worksheets or your teacher's attitude or whatever it is. But I'm afraid we have to wrap this up now and, and come to a vote. So thank you all very much for being open and honest. And just to remind you all, the motion we're voting on is those who commit antisocial behaviour, offences in town centres should be banned. So A, if you agree, B, if you disagree, and C, if you don't know. Yeah. yeah, so let's count down, make sure everybody votes. Three, Three two, two, one. Disagree. <laughs> okay, so I'm afraid that this session come to an end now. I would just like to say a really big thank you to all our excellent speakers. Thank you for preparing speeches and putting thought and effort together into what these motion, motions should be. So I'd like you all to join me in thanking all the speakers and thanking everybody that's here today. <laughs> and a big thank you to the Festival of Politics for inviting Sarah and I to be part of this today. It really means a lot to us. And I think we're going to hand over to Hamira now, who's going to say a couple of words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Snook. That was absolutely fantastic. And what a session it's been. The Festival of Politics here at the Scottish Parliament is about providing a rich understanding of the issues affecting modern Scotland. And that's why this Young People's Day is so important to not just the Parliament, but for the future of Scotland. We cannot look to the issues in the future without considering them from a young person's perspective because you are the future of this country. And positive change is not just an idea for today, but it's exactly the approach young people across Scotland are taking to make a real difference to our society. And we have seen over the last year that young people are making a strong positive case for their vision of Scotland. And not just at a national level, but some are local and all are making a difference. And it's clear that national politicians are paying more and more attention to young people as the discussions on votes at 16 are clearly showing. But the national focus mustn't take away from what has been a very successful day. 
The Young Person's Day is an enormous challenge, and I know so many people have worked incredibly hard to put this day together. So can I just take this opportunity to pay particular thanks to Rosemary and her team, all the Scottish parliamentary staff, the Scottish Youth Parliament, Marie and Catherine, especially the Zumba session earlier on this morning. I would also like to pay, pay a special thank you to all the members of the Scottish Youth Parliament who were instrumental in the planning of today. Um, and also a very special thank you to Snook, to Lauren and Sarah. Um, and what an inspirational couple that they are. Um, great business partners. And I was really, really proud to hear about your, your ambition to influence government. And the fact that you're here within two years of your master's is an inspiration. Something that I hope we can all take forward. And what struck me most today is how eloquent, in, intelligent, and passionate all of the views that I've heard today in the chamber and in the garden lobby earlier on from the young people. I think you're all brilliant ambassadors to your peers, and I think our government, our institutions, and wider society would really benefit from utilizing your skill sets. And wasting so much talent is not an option for this country. Because the work that we do in the Scottish Youth Parliament is all about how democracy is most effective when its representation reflects the community which it serves. So if there's a legacy from today, I hope that it's Scotland's current leaders will listen to what you have to say, will champion your issues, and will help to challenge the negative stereotypes some people still have about young people. And before I end, I just want to say a few things. Um, you've all been very well behaved, and I would just want to say a few thank yous. What I would like you to do is, is our last opportunity to make some noise in the chamber. I just want to kind of reinforce the fact that anything is possible. And being a young person in Scotland should not be seen as a barrier to your success, but it should be seen as an asset to your achievement. Thank you all for making this a fantastic day. The day is not ended. What I would like to do is encourage you to stay in the Parliament if you have time to do so. In the garden lobby, there is a chill out session. Refreshments and hot food will be provided. Um, the Young Scott Infomobile is here and there'll be live music. And also, I believe Sarah and Lauren will be sticking around to demonstrate to us how we can take forward some of the issues that were discussed. So, please give yourself a massive round of applause and thank you very much.